warm welcome to all of you lovers of art and history who are gathered here today to honor and to celebrate the life and work of artist Barnett Newman. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein Spielvogel, Chair of the Historic Landmarks Preservation Center and the NYC Landmarks 50 Alliance, a committee of 97 distinguished and dedicated individuals and organizations committed to informing the public about the past, present, and the future of historic preservation in our city. Our thanks, as always, to the Historic Districts Council, Simeon Bankoff, and especially Frampton Talbert, Talbert, the Deputy Director, who assists with the approvals and the installation, and to the board and to the residents of 685 West End Avenue, to the Barnett Newman Foundation, and our special thanks to Josh Marwell. A foremost color field painter, an abstract expressionist, Barnett Newman moved to this address in 1958, the same year that he began his towering series of paintings, Stations of the Cross, that were first shown at the Guggenheim Museum in 1966, and interpreted by some as a memorial to victims of the Holocaust. Rejecting expressive brushstrokes, his mature style of painting incorporated broad areas of color traversed by vertical lines or zips, which define the space of a painting. Represented in major collections throughout the world, Newman's legacy is his acknowledged role as a founder of modern painting and his broad impact on successive generations of artists, and whose work, 50 years on, still crackles with relevance. And now we will begin our program of distinguished colleagues, critics, and curators. Amy Newman, no relation, author of the admired book, Defining Modern Art, Selected Writings of Alfred Barr, co-written with Irving Sandler, has written extensively on contemporary and modern art. She is currently writing a biography of Barnett Newman. The collection's curator for Cravath, Swain and Moore, and Davis Wright Tremaine Law Firms, Amy has taught at Columbia University, was managing editor of Art News, a former member of the NISCA board, and on the board of several organizations, and most relevant to today's occasion, Landmark West. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Barbara Lee. I just want to start out by asking you if you were aware that Barney's, some of his oldest friends, Leo and Alice Yaman, and Jesse Lowenthal, and the wonderful Karma, the wonderful, sorry, Carmen Herrera, used to call him Barnaby. But they called <laughs> Annalee and Barney Barnaby. And I should tell you that he and Tony Smith and Jackson Pollock made me part of their birthday celebrations as part of them. Well, okay. Well, I'm glad that we've gotten that settled. Yes. Okay. Um, I th I'm going to take the occasion to talk about Barney the New Yorker. Um, we have much more important art historians here to talk about the artist. Barney once claimed that the notion of the New York School only existed in California. He said, if by New York is meant its institutions, it did not do that much for him. In fact, it was the other way around. I helped make New York a place, he said. And then he gave some credit to Pollock, de Kooning, and the others. What he was talking about, of course, was New York as a center of art. The art institutions during his early career did not particularly recognize or support him. And New York only became the vital center of art we know because of him and the other guys. According to his version, they put New York on the map. 
But on this occasion, we'll excuse his characteristically puffed up interpretation and look at the fact that in fact, New York, the city, had a great deal to do with making the man who made the art. He was really the only painter of the so-called New York school actually to be a New Yorker. One could make the case that Adolf Gottlieb, who was also born in the city, was one, but I'm not gonna make that case because I too have my own interpretations. It wasn't simply that Barney was born on Cherry Street on the lower, very, very east side, moved to the Bronx, went to high school in Manhattan, and lived on the west side, the east side, and Brooklyn on Pierpont Street before landing here on West End Avenue. By the way, he also had settled his parents in Forest Hills, right near the, train, the tennis stadium. On the other hand, I have no evidence so far that he actually ever set foot in Staten Island, although I have no doubt that he rode the ferry. What I mean is that he truly lived the New York experience, both internally, where it was definitional to whom he was, and externally. In many ways, the story of his life embodied all the forces of the 20th century. Cherry Street was the site of the earliest and some of the worst tenements in New York. But when the Newmans the Newmans moved into 462, it was a brand new building that met all the improvements required by the city's important new tenement law. And it was adjacent to the brand new Corlears Hook Park. He learned to swim in the East River. I don't know if any of you saw the wonderful George Bellows paintings at the Met last season, which showed these boys diving off rubbish heaps into the East River. Barney was one of them. His family left Cherry Street as the building of the Manhattan Bridge changed that area much for the worse. When they relocated to the Tremont section of the Bronx, the Newmans would actually see farmland take the shape of a modern community with mass transit, a commercial district, and civic and cultural institutions being built under their eyes. He had the classic New York City school system experience, experimental programs in what was then known as elementary school, commuting to, at first, provisional annexes of DeWitt Clinton High School, and then to the new, optimistically grandiose Charles Snyder Building, now the John Jay College of Criminal Justice at, on 10th Avenue at 58th Street. He attended City College in its glory days. He taught in the New York City school system and did battle with its bureaucracy. All of these things are recognizable to New Yorkers. And he cared about New York. I'm sure you've all heard that he ran for mayor. That's generally treated as a sort of capricious conceptual art prank. But in the election of 1933, the most contested ever seen, there were 14 parties plus independents who were represented. And voters had increased by 50%. There were a lot of people who had something to say in that Depression era election. Barney didn't believe he was going to be elected, but he rarely thought about problems, but he really thought about problems in the Depression era city, and he wanted his, and we have to admit, fairly utopian sounding ideas on education, on city planning, on culture, on taxes to be put on the table. Whether or not Fiorello LaGuardia relied on Barney's platform when he ultimately followed through on some of those very ideas, we'll never know. Did I mention that he was addicted to the city's many newspapers and popular columnists? And that his media sophistication was put to great use on many fronts throughout his life and career as an artist? The run for mayor, for instance, was mainly to get his ideas published in the press. 
and he managed to get A.J. Liebling to do it. He wrote letters to editors and columnists constantly, and he regularly was noticed for it. He loved the city as perhaps only a first-generation New Yorker could, and he recognized and celebrated its cosmopolitanism in the face of the prejudice and xenophobia rampant in other parts of the country, which he knew about from reading his newspapers. I want to read a portion of an essay Barney wrote in 1939 about Lower Manhattan, where his father's wholesale menswear business and where Barney worked for years was located. I'm especially fond of this appreciation, not because of its accuracy, which is questionable, but because of how vividly his affection and Epicurean voice comes through. Although the only other bits of America that he had ever seen were in New England, and he had never seen any of Europe, he wrote, the artists and the writers who have gone to Europe to come back yelling America have proven their dislike of America by their insistence on linking New York with Europe. To them, America is the fields of canvas and the dirty water of the Mississippi. Have they forgotten that New York was America long before Kansas was even seen by a white man? The world knows New York by its new landmarks, and yet there is a part of New York where one gets the sense of history, the charm of age, and tradition. This is the district around City Hall. The tip of the island of Manhattan forms a compact, heterogeneous cosmopolis where one can still have the charming feeling of living in two centuries, where one can still catch the friendliness of the small town where one can still savor the distinctive American flavor. Hemmed in by two rivers on its sides, where a short walk can take you from one to the other, and by two old-fashioned commons on the north and south, Bowling Green and City Hall Park, one feels a sense of the whole city and its past, the huge wall that lined the narrow lanes of a colonial village the skyscrapers and the two-story revolutionary houses, the marketplace and the central office directing the transcontinental corporation, the tiny churchyard and the huge railroad terminals. The old landing piers and the gigantic bridges, the tiny shops and the huge department stores, the old bookshop and the immense newspaper plant, all are jammed close together as can happen only in New York. And all the small and the large contrast can be seen at once together. People coming in so picturesquely on ferries and from tunnels and over bridges and by seaplane and motor yacht. All the subways converge there within a block of each other adding to the feeling of concentration. The sense of focus of people and things and time is immense, and one feels oneself at the steering wheel of, of enterprise. We can forgive the pride of New York, the pride New Yorkers feel that from here, the country and the world are being run. Chambers Street is the happy paradise of the sport lover. Within a few blocks, the sportsman can buy guns, fishing tackle, sails, yachts, and if he has time for something more serious, books. As Thomas Street, one of the few private thoroughfares, is the center of the cotton industry. Here one can catch the flavor of New England not only because of the concentration of dry goods, but because it is the most perfect remaining stand of 19th century architecture. Here the metal pillars form story after story of Byzantine windows. Um, the most perfect example of neo-Renaissance architecture in the whole city. One might think of one as in the Paris Opera House. Walk through the leather district 
and look at and smell all manner of hides. Around the corner is the Washington Market, small business, small brick buildings, I'm finished, where one gets a deeper realization of the nature of vegetables than on a farm, for New York is a city of specialists. You want to save some interest for your book, Amy. No, 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 there's, <laughs> I'm getting there, just I think shortly. I have to be there now. <laughs> I'm getting there. Um, okay. Uh, it, he goes on. It's a little like E.B. White's Here is New York, but it was written 10 years before. The elegiac essay was provoked by controversial rehabilitation of City Hall Park by City Planning Commissioner Robert Moses, a favorite target for New Yorkers even then. Moses, Barney wrote, desecrated City Park, City Hall Park, a perfect example of an American old common. The trees are gone. They couldn't stand the hurricane of 1938, but they most likely wished it were so, for the hand of Robert Moses planned to destroy them. Barney's interest in land use issues and his involvement, the true badge of the New Yorker, continued through the loss to urban renewal of his beloved Front Street studio, and until the last year of his life, when he was the senior delegate in Artists Against the Expressway, a movement that opposed the 1969 plan to build a major traffic artery across Broome Street. Those protests saved Soho. Uh, I'm there. As a young man, Barney hung out at the New York Public Library and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. For a while, he haunted the Museum of Natural History. He curated two surprising exhibitions from its collections, and he established a working relationship with its chairman of the Department of Anthropology in a bold, if ultimately failed, effort to mount mixed contemporary and ancient art shows. He was a regular at the Metropolitan Opera, at Yankee Stadium, at the St. Nicholas Boxing Arena, when it still existed near Columbus Circle, at the old Madison Square Garden on 50th Street, at the Five Spot Jazz Club. He knew the place on 2nd Avenue that had the last surviving musical automaton in New York. He liked to watch the sparring fighters at Stillman's Gym. He had charge accounts at Gage and Tolna, the Russian Tea Room, Gloucester House, and Barney Greengrass, where he took everyone from Cy Newhouse to the magisterial Swiss gallerist Ernst Beiler for bagels and locks. And he had a studio at the Carnegie Hall Studios. The waiters at Sweets Fish Restaurant in the Fulton Market all knew him well. All of these New York institutions for what seemed like generations are now gone or are unrecognizable with the exception of our Upper West Side Barney Greengrass. So, although 685 West End Avenue cannot be called an institution of any sort, there's no doubt Barney would be enormously gratified to be the cause of making this remnant of his New York celebrated. Thank you, Amy, for that very careful and interesting and detailed introduction to your book. We're looking forward to the rest of it. And now, Robert Murray, a Canadian sculptor, printmaker, painter, and art teacher, first met Newman in 1959 at a summer workshop in Saskatchewan for Canadian artists. Mr. Murray soon moved to New York and in 1962 began to assist Newman with casting sculptures and introduced him to the Lippincott Foundry where Broken Obelisk was eventually cast. A close friend of the artist, Robert Murray's works are in the collection of the Whitney Museum, the Hirshhorn Museum, Storm King Art Center, and the Walker Art Center, among other institutions. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. 
Well, at the risk of being slightly redundant here, uh, let me just say that I met Barney Nanley in Canada in 1959 at something called the University of Saskatchewan Emma Lake Artist Workshop. If Newman had a message for all of us, it was probably to take our painting and sculpture seriously and to put this activity first in our lives. Um, when I moved to New York City in 1960, one of the first places I visited was 685 West End Avenue to see the Newmans. And for the next decade, it was a place where I would spend a great deal of time. What struck me about their apartment was that it contained very little furniture. The living room held a few wooden office chairs and a modest couch, and it was given over almost entirely to Barney's paintings, hung on chains from picture molding high up in the wall. Barney had a studio on Front Street, but he was very guarded about who was allowed to enter, and most visitors came to this apartment, where all but the largest paintings could be seen. My guess is that this must have been one of the most unusual apartments in the whole building. At times, it seemed a veritable UN of the art world, with visitors coming from all over the world. I can only imagine what the Newman's neighbors must have thought, but for me, it was a manifestation of Barney's message at Emma Lake. Put your work first in your life, no matter what else you have to do to make a living. Barney dressed well. Some people thought he looked as dapper as an English banker. But there was nothing bourgeois about the Newman's apartment. It was, above all else, a serious place dominated by his work. I'm very pleased to see that the residence of an important American abstract painter and sculptor is being recognized. It doesn't happen often enough in this country. I remember staying in Rue Le Pique in Paris a number of years ago, and in the top of our street, there was a house marked with a similar plaque that said, Residence of Theo Van Gogh. It gave context to what I knew about Theo and his famous brother, and perhaps that will also help happen for this historic location as well. Thank you. A longtime friend and admirer of Barnett Newman is known for his innovative and wide-ranging creativity. One of the most important painters and sculptors of the last 50 years, still his work is in the collection of almost every major contemporary museum. He was awarded the National Medal of Arts by President Obama in 2008 and the Lifetime Achievement Award for Contemporary Sculpture by the International Sculpture Center in 2011. Last year, his work was the subject of a retrospective exhibition, this time at the Wolfsburg Kunstmuseum in Germany. It's a real pleasure to see you, friend. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I could make it incredibly brief by saying that I remember being here, and the thing that I remember most about going into Barney's apartment is watching Anna Lee go to the kitchen to get him a glass of water. And I'd give anything for a glass of that water right now. Thank you. Tony Toll is a poet associated with the New York School of Frank O'Hara, John Ashbery, and Kenneth Koch. A recipient of NISCA and NEA fellowships, his 12th book of poems, Winter Journey, was published in 2008, nearly 50 years ago. In June 1964, in 2008, nearly 50 years ago, in June 1964, he was secretary and assistant to Tatiana Grossman at the Long Island Lithography stu Studio that she founded. Among the dozen New York artists invited to explore lithography there, at the studio at that time was Barnett Newman, who produced his portfolio, 18 Cantos, that year. Perhaps you can tell us about it. This is not in my remarks, but, uh, but as to the glass of water, when Tanya and I were here on various print businesses, he just asked for vodka and tonic. I mean, was, there was no euphemism there. And I was allowed to have one too. Tanya hated drinking, but if the artist was going to have a drink, I was allowed to keep him company. And there was one, at least one time that, um, uh, and of course, vodka tonics, 
me and Barney, we were sitting in a place, they looked, they looked alike. And uh, one evening I picked up one drink and I was about to have it, I had it to my lips, and Annalise said, no, 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 that's Barney's. But it was too late, I had already taken a sip. It was very weak, but three times as weak as mine. <laughs> so she tried, but... Uh, So, I, I've just tried to give this little story of, um, of which I had written down, so it's more writing and talking, otherwise I'll forget it and would be here all day. So I'm honored to be a part of this. I, I, in my ULA diary, the first time I was in this building was September 15th, 1964. And I think the last time was November 18th, 1969. So I dropped off an etching plate for Barney to work on. And I don't know if I had ever saw him again before the next July, but anyway, I'm glad to see this building honored the way they do in Paris, and uh, I've always felt, felt close to the building as well as, well as uh, who lived in it. To put things into chronological, chronological perspective, when I met Barnett Newman on August 30th, 1964, I was 25 and he was 59. Two months earlier, I had started working as secretary and general assistant for Tatiana Grossman at her lithography studio, Universal Limited Art Editions in West Islip, Long Island, better known as ULAE or simply Tanya Grossman's. The printing of Newman's lithographic portfolio, 18 Cantos, was just being completed at this time. And on August 30th, Newman and his wife, Anna Lee, of course, came out to the studio and I helped him and Tanya with the sorting of the unsigned lithographs into their respective sets. Next, Newman signed and numbered a sample print on the bottom margin, as is traditional, number on the left, signature on the right. But then Tanya asked him where he wanted the publisher's seal to be embossed. This was a step the artist hadn't thought about. The publisher's seal brings a graphic work into official existence and uh, Tanya convinced Barney of its importance. Now the ULA seal is a very ungainly eight pound cast iron object, only embossed easily from the left. So most ULA prints have the seal in the lower left margin. I should add that Tanya made it my task to seal new additions uh, very early on. So, but Barney, after characteristically unhurried deliberation, decided he would like to seal emboss diagonally over his signature, ideally right on the W and M of Newman. And it pleased him to learn that a poet, me, would be performing this operation. My problems were, one, embossing it diagonally made it even more tricky than usual to predict where exactly the seal would appear on the paper after I pushed the lever down. And two, Barney wanted it done immediately to a portfolio of prints after he signed them, and in, the end in his presence. As benign and sociable as his presence was, it added to my anxiety. I knew that the cantos had been difficult to print. It was not an option to ruin them by misembossment. Eventually, I went through this anxiety with only minor mishaps about 330 times. I calculated, calculated this just yesterday yesterday, either out at ULAE or here at 685. And it took two years to go to sell the uh, 18 Cantos. Tiny, they were very, the vellum box in which they were um, to be held was very expensive and Tanya had to order them gradually because uh, 18 Cantos didn't sell, by the way. It was $4,000 and that was a lot of money and they didn't fly off the shelves. I don't know what one would be worth today. I think anybody here would like to raise $4,000 and get one, but uh, too late. And um, during the signing and sealing sessions, there was a good deal of informal conversation. Barney liked the fact that I was a New Yorker and that I was a friend and colleague of Frank O'Hara's, on whose recommendation Tanya had hired me. So Barney Newman quickly became Barney as he was to everyone else who knew him, which did not in the least detract from his genial gravitas or his inherent elegance. 
His signature monocle didn't even seem eccentric, let alone affected, at least to me. Uh, my time is about up, so I will wrote a poem in 1970, and uh, let me read that, a short poem. It's called Peace, P-I-E-C-E. -E. I have a book in my pocket that contains a list of all the countries of the world. But those islands now, as I walk near the Hudson, quite frankly heartbroken, have taken on the aspect of a deserted forest. And within it, I am walking, open to great abstraction, which is not seen abstractly. And which carefully, from his point in the world, Barnett Newman distills from the heroic sublime. He used to ask me with a confidential twinkle if I were sure I wasn't just a little bit Jewish. I said that anything was possible, and we laughed. On July 4th, he became silent and closed an access to the sublime blue. It is difficult to breathe in his triple air of sublimity and difficult not to embellish my life. Thank you. Thank you. And now our last speaker, Anne Temkin the chief curator of painting and sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art, began her career as a curatorial assistant at MoMA and then joined the Philadelphia Museum of Art where she was the curator of modern and contemporary art for 13 years and the curator of the retrospective Barnett Newman exhibition in 2002. Dr. Temkin has written numerous articles and essays for many publications, including Art Forum, Art in America, Art News, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art, and on and on. She is one of the most distinguished curators of contemporary art in the United States. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, everybody. It's so good to see um, many old friends here. One of the um, truisms among art historians is that you learn a lot more about an artist's work by reading the negative reviews of it rather than the positive reviews. And this gave me a lot of raw material in the case of Barnett Newman, um, because there were certainly far more of the bad than the good. One of the most eloquent and I think revealing examples of those was for his second exhibition at the Betty Parsons Gallery in 1951, where a newspaper reporter for the New York Daily Telegraph at that time walked in and described what you saw, essentially these blank walls, and then dramatically she wrote, then I realized the pictures, got that wrong, the walls were the pictures. And these things, obviously, that she had been thinking were waiting for paintings to come onto them were all she was going to get. And this was kind of the spirit of most of the criticism Newman encountered throughout his life. What Americans especially want in contemporary art is noticing and being made very much aware of the labor that an artist exerted. And for Newman, the labor was up here and in here and didn't need to be expressed here. And this was very, very difficult for people. So it was not only difficult for a general art reviewer in a New York Daily paper in 1951, it was also difficult for the Board of Trustees of the New York Museum of Modern Art in 1968. And here I'll give you one of my favorite anecdotes from an acquisitions meeting at our museum. Ben Hiller, the great collector living on Central Park West rather than West End Avenue, worked out a package deal with the museum in which we would receive from him for a certain price a Gorky painting, a number of Jackson Pollock paintings, and Vir Heroicus Sublimis, the 18-foot-long Barnett Newman painting. 
Board of Trustees met, discussed this offer, came to a conclusion. Bill Rubin, the curator, then had to call Ben Heller and say, Ben, it's all green light for the Pollocks, it's green light for the Gorky, and it's thumbs down for the Barnett Newman. Now, in my experience, what I would certainly expect to happen at that point was for the donor to hang up the phone, or if they didn't hang up the phone, say, deal's off. And this is really one for the ages. Um, as the story goes, what Ben Heller said to Bill Rubin was, okay, you buy the Gorky and the Pollocks, I'm giving you. Ver heroicus sublimis. <laughs> And that says a lot about many things, but in particular, I think, about how strong the advocates of Newman's work, in fact, were in their advocacy. And so indeed, on our walls today, on the fourth floor, you find Vir Heroicus Sublimis um, hanging proudly and always, never coming down. Fast forward a few years later, um, from 1968 to 1970, Newman's death, there is a retrospective of Newman's work curated by Tom Hess at the Museum of Modern Art. What we are told about it is that the museum never before and never since was so empty. Fast forward 30 years from that, I'm at the Philadelphia Museum. I'm generally in the um, habit of giving tours to visitors to the museums, to the museum's modern art department. Everyone's with me, no matter what we're looking at, Picasso's, Brancusi's, even Duchamp, on and on, until we get to the painting there by Barnett Newman. And then it was just absolutely apparent to me that I lost my customers um, flat. And for that reason specifically, I decided to do a retrospective exhibition of the paintings and sculptures and prints and drawings of Barnett Newman. And I'm not sure I used that as my sales pitch um, at the time, but it was really what possessed me to do it. And I think I was motivated by the famous um, remark of Proust that one finds as an artist one's contemporaries 50 years later. So I was looking at my calendar and my watch and thought, okay, the 50 years are here, let's go for it. And in fact, I don't think we had lines around the block, but the museum was definitely not empty and it did it was incredibly gratifying to see people coming and realizing that maybe they don't understand a Barnett Newman if they just see one, but if they see a whole 20,000 square foot amount of them, yes, then it all did begin to make sense. Here, back in New York, in the sculpture garden of the Museum of Modern Art, we always have the broken obelisk. The sculpture garden seems empty when it's not in there. And I think we're welcoming new generations of viewers to think about Newman's work as a sculptor, as a painter, as a maker of prints and drawings in ways that he would not have been able to anticipate and for certain would not have approved of. In fact, very in a very timely way, today I got a request from the German photographer Andreas Gursky to come and be able to photograph Vir Heroicus Sublimis for a, a new project of his. And I will answer yes with a certain amount of certainty that Newman will not like whatever comes of that, but equally certain that this is the way that Newman, despite himself, would be absolutely thrilled to see his work continuing into the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And now it is a pleasure, Frampton, to dedicate this cultural medallion to the accomplishments of Barnett Newman. Cultural medallions are porcelainized enamel plaques affixed to the exterior of buildings throughout New York City to, to commemorate an individual or an occurrence that has made a significant contribution to New York City's rich cultural heritage and to create a sense of pride in our history most people or events are nominated for inclusion by members of the, of the public, including today. Thank you again. And now Frampton Tolbert and Simeon Bankoff will unveil and read the text 
of the cultural medallion. But before they do, because that should be our last note, I want you to know that there are 100 cultural medallions, more than that number, in place throughout all of New York City. And we hope you will attend the upcoming ceremonies. The next is October 16th at 3 p.m. for the Dust Bowl Balladeer Woody Guthrie at 74 Charles Street and on November 13th at 11 a.m. for the renowned architectural critic Ada Louise Huxtable at 969 Park Avenue. So if any of you have verifiable information and know of an individual who has made a contribution, a remarkable contribution in a building that is still standing, please let us know. And we'd like to hear from you. And Deborah, will you distribute some of those forms in case anyone has someone in mind uh, that they would care to nominate? If you'd like to learn more about our programs, please see HLPC Cultural Medallions Org. So our thanks to each and all of you for joining us today, for celebrating the work of Barnett Newman here, where some of you live and where history happened. Barnett Newman, January 29th, 1905 to July 4th, 1970, 685 West End Avenue, Manhattan. Born on the Lower East Side, the son of Jewish immigrants from Poland, abstract expressionist Barnett Newman was one of the foremost color field painters of the mid 20th century. His rejection of expressive brushstrokes in favor of harder edged fields of pure flat color was a precursor to minimalism and an important influence on younger painters. Many of his works had a philosophical bent and reflected his interest in myths and primitive unconsciousness. His trademark zips, a, lifetime, a lifelong feature of his work, were characterized by a thin vertical line that zips through large areas of color. Newman series, The Stations of the Cross, 1958 to 1966, considered the peak of his achievement and started shortly before he moved here, together with his wife, Anna Lee, has been interpreted as a memorial to the victims of the Holocaust. His best-known sculpture, Broken Obelisk, 1963, depicts an inverted obelisk whose point balances on the apex of a pyramid.